Um, so today's video is a little bit of theory because I got a lot of questions concerning the transition state uh, calculation specifically and I by no means I like I want to be like a prof and explain the theory and details and stuff because there are people who know way more than me and you should refer to them but as a very crude first idea to sort of place things in your head uh, this is what's for especially if you're just starting to do calculations and you're starting reading those heavy textbooks that go into a lot of detail it might not be the easiest thing to start off with if you really don't know what's going on so in this powerpoint i want to quickly go over what is a transition state and why is it so complicated to calculate it and uh, a little bit of you know explanation as to why it's so hard so shall we let's go the way we usually imagine the energy changes during your reactions the way we were taught about it in like thermodynamics right so we have the gibbs free energy changes and that's what we always picture when we think about energy of a reaction right but then if we stop for a second and think what is this curve about what does it mean what does every point on this curve mean right it has to correspond to something in reality in real life and so what is it actually every single point on this curve corresponds to a structure Right. If you have, let's say, here I have an example of um, a control molecular reaction. I have a formation of a, of like a, two rings, right? And so, what happens is at every point on this curve, there is a structure corresponding to that energy, right? And you can follow along and go from reactants to products by going step by step through all of these structures so what i'm trying to get at is that the two-dimensional representation is a very very crude simplification of what it actually looks like because it's very rare that you'll have like two atoms coming together and that's it right so usually for a mini atom system you have a multi-dimensional surface it's kind of really hard to picture because the higher we can get, the highest we can get is three-dimensional. And for example, for me, it's like 2D. My world is flat. But if we pretend that we're having a reaction that can be described by a three-dimensional surface, right? So if we go from this curve to a three-dimensional representation, of the energy right so then this surface will be called potential energy surface PES right L what is the ground state on this graph the ground state is a place on this potential energy surface where no matter w like where you're trying to go no matter what direction you take a step into you will always increase in energy Right, so that's for the ground state, and for the transition state, it's a saddle point. So it's very similar to ground state, except that in only one direction, you have a decrease in energy. Okay, and often in textbooks you will see direction, but what is meant is actually more of like a vector that can go both ways right so if you follow this arrow over here that would be this direction what they're talking about so here I circled one is that would be like a ground state say let's say you go from reactants to products right and then two somewhere over here there would be this point at which no matter where you go, you will always increase in energy except along one like curve. Now that would be a transition state. 
and it's very important to have only one of those directions and not more. And so why 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 only one direction? Why can't you go like higher? Why can't you come here? Or at the peak of the of the potential energy surface? Why do you have to have such a specific point that you're looking for? Right? If you heat up more your reaction more and give more energy, you will go faster, right? If you're an experimentalist, that's how it works. The problem is if you're doing a calculation and you go you give it so much energy, right? You jump to higher saddle points. Then you're like on top of a mountain. And if you ma imagine yourself on top of a hill, well, you can go down the hill in so many different directions and you can take so many different paths that the chances that you'll end up at the desired product are very low. And already these calculations are taking forever. If you have to also determine which one goes where, then you'll never get to. So technically, you want to be at the saddle point to go from one ground state to the other ground state instead of going all the way here and then just sliding down into, you know, the unknown. So basically what you're doing as a theoretical, as a computational chemist, right, and you're, you're trying to find the transition state of a reaction is that you're poking around the potential energy surface not really knowing where you're going so it's like basically walking around blindfolded and then you bump into something you're like oh, i wonder what that is and then you kind of explore it and hope that you hit, you hit the right thing so once again the main assumption is that the most probable path that connects your reactants to your products has to have the lowest energy possible right but you need to have enough energy to go over that energy barrier that separates the two while staying as low as possible. So what does it mean to do a transition state search and what are the main steps? Uh, usually, this is very crude, right? I'm skipping a lot of important things here, but just very short. What happens usually is you would optimize uh, your reactants, then you would optimize your products, and um, the assumption is that your transition state should be somewhere in between. It's very rarely right in between, so you have to, you know, spend quite some time to find this, uh, what I say, a key constraint. Um, so you have to pick the atoms that will eventually form that bond that you're looking at and you have to figure out their position according you know relative to each other you have to find that distance that separates them far enough not to force them into the products yet but then close enough not to push them back to the reactants and this is the really complicated step and then when you optimize this constraint structure that you you hope would be a transition state then you have to do a frequency calculation and make sure that the imaginary frequency that you get is you have only one of them and that it corresponds to the movement like the vibration corresponds to these atoms going from reactants to products Right. This is the, it's it's a long process if you don't really know where you're going, uh, and especially the subtle like the the frequency calculations are rather um, long, depending on your you know uh, computer power uh, availabilities. Right. But if your system is large, then it's kind of long. But it's an unnecessary step. Uh, there is no way out. Uh, so this is uh, this is the end. Um, I hope I sort of made clear some of those things and um, leave me comments or email me if you have more questions. Uh, yeah, I'll be back soon. Something else.